Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. It's my absolute pleasure to be the moderator for this webinar. Our agenda for the hour is shown on the screen. We are aiming for about 25 minutes for the presentation and about 20 minutes for the Q&A session. Uh, but before we get started, we'd like to request that you type into the Q&A box where you're dialing in from so we get a sense of our audience today. We know lots of people registered from different parts of the world, so we'd love to know where you're dialing in from. So use the Q&A box if you can. Uh, we'll give ourselves a minute or two, see people um, are willing, able to share with us where they're dialing in from, okay? Boston, California, Utah, San Francisco, wonderful. Oakland, Utah, Oakland, Uganda, Seattle, U.S., uh, Lee Pinesa, Seattle, uh -huh. San Francisco, Stockholm, that's wonderful, um, Kenya, Uganda, Bay Area, Seattle, Uganda, Kentucky, that's wonderful. Any more? Let me see. I uh, see Chicago, Nairobi, Kenya. Kenya again. Excellent. Excellent. This is good. Thank you so much for letting us know where you're from. So it sounds like uh, our audience is primarily from uh, the places where the presenters have relationships. Kenya, Uganda, San Francisco, as well as Seattle, where uh, Jeff Smith is speaking from. So on that note, um, let me introduce our speakers. Uh, we have three presenters today all of whom are principal investigators for the East Africa Preterm Birth Initiative study that we're gonna hear about. Our first presenter is Professor Dillis Walker. She's an obstetrician gynecologist and a professor in the Department of Obstet Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences and Global Health at University of, San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco in the US. Professor Walker and her team developed a novel approach to emergency training, which many of you know as Pronto, using highly realistic simulation and team training to improve obstetric and neonatal outcomes. Our next speaker after Dr. Walker would be Dr. Felgona Otieno, who is a pediatrician and epidemiologist with long-standing research experience in the area of maternal child health with a focus on nutrition and HIV. At the Kenya Medical Research Institute, Kenry, she's a principal clinical research scientist based at the Center for Clinical Research. Our third speaker is Dr. Peter Weiswa, who is a health systems researcher with particular focus on newborn health and development, as well as maternal newborn child health services. Dr. Weiswa's research and program interests include health systems research, policy analysis, implementation and operations research, and how well those are linked to programming. He's on the faculty at Makerere University, School of Public Health in Uganda, as well as Karolinska Institute in Sweden. We also have Dr. Jeffrey Smith from the Bill and the Gates Foundation, who will provide his reflections on the research findings and the discussion towards the end of the hour. This study was funded by the Gates Foundation. Dr. Smith is Deputy Director for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health at the Gates Foundation. He's an obstetrician, gynecologist, and global health strategist with 25 years of clinical and public health experience in developing countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And finally, you have me, your moderator. I'm Dr. Nana Chumdan, so I'm a public health and preventive medicine physician with expertise in quality improvement, health system strengthening, and maternal child health in Africa, Latin America, and South Asia. Currently, I'm the managing director for the Rockefeller Foundation, Prior to that, I actually consulted with the PTBI team as the senior quality improvement advisor, which I guess is why they invited me to be moderator. Uh, slide four, please. So I'd like to get to the study. Um, before we start though, I wanted to just make a few comments uh, to frame the, the study and the findings. Um, the first is that this uh, intervention was complex, it was adaptive and iterative based on local contextual issues that were identified by the implementers. The second point is that the health workers in their locations, in their actual clinics and hospitals, were the implementers with support from the project staff from PTBI. And then thirdly, the implementers represented a broad spectrum of health workers across the hierarchy for all the way from senior leaders, middle managers, as well as frontline providers such as doctors, nurses, 
midwives, lab techs, etc. And then finally, it's important to note that this study relied on routine health services data uh, that were collected by the health system itself, which created a path towards improvement in data quality, local capacity building, and sustainability. So those are my framing comments. And now, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Dillis Walker to kick us off. Dillis. Thanks so much, Nana. Uh, really great to have you here today and, and wonderful to see so many people from around the world joining us. Um, and thanks for giving us a sense of what the context, some of the issues around where we did this work. Uh, we're very excited to share this information about this package uh, that we implemented and its impact on stillbirth and neonatal mortality. But before we get into the meat of it, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we got here and how we got to this intervention package. And we began this journey with our partners in 2014 with generous funding from the Gates Foundation. And we were tasked with what sounded and felt like a daunting mandate to decrease the burden of preterm birth in the geographies where we work. So in Kenya and Uganda, we reached out to our colleagues who will be speaking to you shortly, Felgona and Peter, and we began to figure out what was the best way to approach this investment and how to address this problem. So the options were wide open. So after almost a year of planning and stakeholder engagement, we landed on a portfolio of work that included this trial that we're talking to you about today, as well as a large trial in Rwanda that looked at group antenatal care and its impact on preterm birth. Our portfolio also includes a number of nested studies within both of these big anchoring um, studies, as well as a fellowship program with the aim of building a cadre of preterm birth researchers within the region. So as you can see on this slide, and I imagine to almost everyone online, it's not new news that preterm birth is the leading cause of death among newborns. Uh, together, among the, together with intrapartum asphyxia, preterm birth accounts for over almost 25% of all under five deaths. And most of these deaths occur right around the time of birth. So this made it clear to us that if we were going to actually make an impact, we should focus around this critical moment. Next, please. Also, right around this time that we were starting this initiative, the Every Newborn Action Plan was launched and published in The Lancet. And the message in that call to action was really clear to us. And that was that there are existing evidence-based interventions particularly those not requiring a lot of advanced skills or technologies that simply need to be better implemented. Uh, and most, many of these are things right around the time of birth, emergency obstetric care, basic newborn resuscitation, essential newborn care. And if we could better implement, we could save millions of lives. So heeding this call to action, next please, we landed on the intervention package. And we were guided as we decided what to do by these three guiding principles. First, we were committed to being true to the Every Newborn Action Plan message of exploring new implementation strategies and not new technologies or interventions. We also quickly learned that our inter intervention needed to have the potential to impact all babies, not just those born preterm, and we also wanted to consider the realities of the burden of stillbirths. And finally, we were committed to keeping the mother and baby dyad together. So labor and delivery is a vulnerable period for both mother and babies, and we need to keep our eye on both of them throughout that entire um, period of transition. So this led to our theory of change. Next, please. We designed an intervention package and package is kind of the key word, word here, of existing interventions that individually had shown promise and improve on both improving data and quality of care. If this were successful, we would impact the number of stillbirths and the preterm neonatal deaths um, and, and, and decrease that burden of prematurity. 
So with this sort of framing, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague and friend, Felgono Tieno, who's in Kenya now, um, to share with us a bit more about the design and those intervention components of the package. Thanks. Well, thank you, Dilis. Um, so just to continue with the discussion, our study was an un unblinded pair mite cluster randomized control trial. In Kenya, we conducted the study in Migori, and in Uganda, it was in uh, Busoga region, and most of these are uh, more rural setting. As you can see in this uh, diagram, we see that the neonatal mortality rates and stillbirth rates are similar in the two regions. Interventions were delivered uh, in the, at the facility level and focusing on quality of care around the time of birth and immediate postpartum period. A total of 20 predominantly public facilities were involved in this study. And the facilities were paramount in the ratio of one to one. Next slide. Our study intervention were, were delivered as a package as Dillis has mentioned and indeed it is the effect of these combined interventions that were measured and reported in this study. The, the first 10 uh, control study facilities received only two of the interventions, while the intervention facilities received a package of four interventions put together. The project, uh, as, as we go to the next slide, we see that um, the, the two, uh, just before we go to this, uh, you see that in the first control sites, we gave them only two interventions, which focused mainly on data strengthening activities, which are mainly uh, on maternity registers. And uh, so the second intervention with the WHO Safe Childbirth Checklist, which was implemented uh, around the uh, implement with a, a clear implementation plan. So basically what we are saying in this slide is that the first, the control, the control, in, uh, control uh, sites received only two interventions and all these interventions were also applied across board for all the other sites. In this slide, we see that the intervention facilities received a package of four, a total of four interventions. So uh, in addition to the data strengthening that I've mentioned, as well as the modified safety harbor checklist, the 10 uh, facilities also received quality improvement through collaborative work and pronto simulation and team training adapted for preterm birth. So this made up a total of the four full intervention package. Next slide. Our hypothesis uh, of the primary outcome was that the full intervention package would reduce the odds of combined fresh still birth and neonatal mortality by 30% among eligible infants. So next, I'm going to tell you a little about each of our interventions. So starting off with the data strengthening, we committed to using data from registers rather than creating a parallel system for data collection. From the outset, the project uh, data team conducted workshops to make sure that providers understood indicators, uh, indicator definitions and, and standardization for the most critical indicators. And our key critical indicators were gestational age, birth weight, up the score at one minute, and discharge status. Uh, before we go to that, uh, the, the addition on the data strengthening activities, we had the team conducting monthly uh, visits to each of the study sites to co collect this uh, birth data uh, information and also assess data completeness as well as accuracy. And whenever they noticed gaps, they sat together with the team and uh, work together to correct these uh, gaps. And more than that, they also engaged in more interactive uh, activities to give feedback and uh, even have uh, uh, time to see how this data can drive their decision making. Next slide. Our second intervention was the modified safe childbirth checklist. So in this, we took the WHO safe childbirth checklist, which is a, a tool developed with evidence to improve maternal and newborn outcomes and adapted it for specificity of preterm birth. 
So this tool was then supplied to all the facilities so that they could use it effectively to identify areas of need and immediate response. And this also helped them to be able to look at um, referral systems. So we go to the next slide. Our third intervention was the quality improvement collaboratives. And in this, uh, facility-based QI teams use PDSA cycles and indicators selected to improve preterm birth accountability and care. These activities were linked also to data decision-making and also to pronto simulation, which is the other intervention activity that we had. Here were collaborative learning sessions were, uh, were held in collaboration with all the fa intervention facilities and together they were able to come and share ideas, share their progress, share how they were performing and in this way they were able then to learn from each other. Next slide. Our fourth intervention was pronto simulation and training, uh, team training. And in this, uh, we had uh, our pronto project trained pronto mentors. And uh, these pronto mentors then worked closely with the healthcare providers in the facilities to provide a safe space for them to practice and gain confidence in life saving skills in a real life setting. A curriculum of selected 12 simulation scenarios was developed and implemented in each of the facilities. And in average, each of the facilities received about two simulations, two team, uh, teamwork activities per month. Pronto exercises were also quite characterized with enhancing teamwork and improved communication. So in addition to all this, the, uh, the mentors provided also bedside mentoring and QI activities during the visit. Next slide. Um, I think there's one slide that is missing, but I'll just say briefly about it. Uh, our primary outcome, yeah. So our primary outcome was combined fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality among eligible infants. So we defined, in this study, we defined eligible infants as uh, fresh stillbirth with birth weights between 1,000 and 2,500 grams, or those with birth weights uh, below 3,000 grams and recorded gestational age of uh, below 37 weeks. So these were infants who were either live or registered as fresh stillbirth. In this way, using these two combinations of gestational age and birth weight, we were able to get the most or more of the vulnerable babies by using those two categories of uh, picking them. Next. So the components of our interventions were rolled in a real world context, such as um, industrial strikes, varying delivery volumes, staff, uh, staff turnover rates, and many other competing events. But as you can see in this slide, the intervention components ended up being uh, introduced in more or less a staggered fashion. So in our study and those interventions that I did mention, we were able to start off with the data strengthening and the modified safe childbirth checklist. And then later on, we layered on the pronto and QI. We also see that uh, Uganda was able to complete data collection much earlier by 20, December 2018. But in Kenya, because of the combined doctors and nurses strike, the uh, data collection period extended up to May 2019. I would say that we saw most of our health providers as well as leaders in these regions gradually embrace and own these interventions. So it was very interesting and um, I would now like to turn over to um, Dr. Peter, if he's already on, to share with us the results. Thank you so much, uh, Fregona, uh, for presenting this background. 
I'm going to be presenting the results. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to be taking th you through our consort uh, diagram, which is basically how this study was organized. As you are aware, we determined 28 day outcome among uh, almost 3,000 eligible newborns. This work was done in 23 uh, facilities that we started with, but um, uh, three major facilities, large facilities that could not be pair marked were excluded. And we ended up with 20 facilities, and it is these 20 facilities that we randomized. In total, these 20 facilities at the time, at the, at the time of the randomization had just over 60,000 register entries of deliveries. We randomized the 20 facilities into 10 intervention facilities and 10 control facilities. We excluded uh, babies if they were full term or macerated or their birth weight was less than a thousand grams. In, in the end, we consented uh, about 66% of the eligible infants in the intervention um, arm and 60% um, in the control arm. Um, at the end, we ended up with about 1,500 babies that were randomized um, to, to each arm. Each arm had about 1,500. Next slide. Now, the lost follow-up was about 13%, uh, so, uh, which was uh, good that um, although we are following up these babies in the communities, we were able to follow up uh, the majority. And most of these were followed up using phone interviews. And in a few cases, we did the motorcycle um, uh, follow-up. Next. In this slide, I show you the facility characteristics uh, of um, uh, intervention and control arms. As you can see, uh, at the time of randomization or matching, these facilities were quite comparable in terms of uh, monthly deliveries, volumes, uh, the staffing levels, the number of stillbirths, and also the proportion of babies who are low birth weight, but also in terms of the pre-discharge neonatal mortality. Next. And, and in this slide, uh, we show you the maternal and infant characteristics across the study arms. Again, the facilities in the intervention and the control arms, we are quite comparable in terms of maternal age, in terms of uh, uh, multiple gestation age rates and numbers, but also in terms of infant characteristics such as uh, low birth weight, uh, gestation age less than 37 weeks, and also in terms of sex, whether they are male or female. Next slide. And, uh, and this is our main result. Our full intervention package reduced the odds of combined fresh stillbirths and neonatal mortality among eligible infants by 34% compared with the control arm. We are quite excited because this is one of the first studies in our context to show such a huge reduction. Uh, this data was adjusted for pairing and uh, for clustering, but also we did further adjustment for characteristics such as C-section rates, infant sex, uh, multiplicity, uh, country, but also birth weight delivery volume and facility readiness. Um, so um, th this is quite important that um, even with um, with this same um, kind of uh, adjustment, we still have a big uh, effect on uh, mortality. 
But as you can see, the confidence intervals are quite wide. And this is mainly contributed to the fact that um, there are a lot of differences, especially among facilities. First of all, we only had 10 facilities in each arm. Uh, but also some of these facilities were mission hospitals, others were general public hospitals, others were ref, uh, referral hospitals, and um, that made some of the difference. And in Kenya, some of the facilities were actually health centers. So we recommend that uh, these results uh, will need to be replicated in other settings. Next slide. <coughs> Uh, here we show again the results. We had reduced mortality, odds, uh, which was significant across all outcomes. Here in the red, we show the main outcome, which is um, the combined uh, composite uh, outcome of first two births plus 28 day uh, mortality. But also we had impact on perinatal mortality. We had impact on 28 day mortality. We had impact on pre-discharge mortality. We had impact on fresh stillbirth. This is quite exciting that this intervention although designed to impact prematurity was able to impact on all these outcomes, which is exciting. For me, one of the most exciting uh, outcomes here is that even at day 28, uh, we had an impact. And remember, for most of these babies, by day 28, they are back in the community. And yet, this was a facility intervention. For a facility intervention to impact beyond facilities, I think it is exciting and it needs more research. Next slide. Now, um, as I said before, that uh, we had a lot of variation among facilities. Here we show that uh, three of the facilities uh, account for a, a lot of the results, but um, uh, and there is variation across uh, different facilities, especially in the intervention arm. So in order to understand this, we did sensitivity analysis, and uh, where we excluded all the three pairs that uh, seem to have the greatest impact, either as a group but also as individuals. But even after doing this kind of sensitivity analysis, our results remain significant, meaning that uh, this, the impact is uh, quite significant and the effect quite strong and the evidence should be quite good. Next slide. Now, of course, it will be interesting to see how did these results vary by country? And we see that um, the results in both countries are quite comparable, but there are some variations. The impact seemed to be a, lot, a, a bit uh, larger in Uganda compared to Kenya. And, um, um, but Ugandan facilities were all hospitals. They had 2.7 more and your birth compared to Kenyan facilities. All the facilities in Uganda had C-section capacity, but also they had a slightly lower facility readiness compared to Kenyan facilities. Next slide. Now, having given these good results, just like any other study, our study had some uh, limitations uh, that I wanted to speak about. First of all, this is a preterm study, and the, in the preterm study, gestation age is quite important. But in this setting, we don't have first trimester outer sound, and um, therefore we tended to use uh, measures such as uh, the birth weight, but also the arch estimation of GA. And that way we think that um, our, our, that makes still our results uh, quite good. But also potential selection bias. Uh, as you see, the, in terms of recruitment, there were a number of uh, failures to recruit. We had 66% uh, 
recruitment in the intervention arm and um, at 60% in the control arm. So this, uh, this failure to recruit could have introduced some section bias. But when we did the analysis, we found that when, you compare, when we compare these outcomes at discharge among those we didn't um, uh, in, include in the study, compared to those that were included, there are no differences. So although there is section bias, we think it is quite limited. Then there were issues of uh, referrals before delivery were excluded uh, because such uh, babies are usually quite complicated and um, uh, that is uh, a limitation, uh, but uh, maybe not as much because there are also not too many. Then in Kenya, but also in Uganda, we had the health work strike, but uh, the strike was longer in Kenya. The study ended much earlier in Uganda compared to Kenya. Kenya, the strike was on for about a year. But actually this shows that when you do a study in the, the real life, you are likely to face these kind of situations. Our study is uh, a robust cluster adjusted analysis and uh, this, uh, uh, despite doing all this robust adjustment, we still were able to see a significant effect on the primary and the secondary outcomes. And uh, we think that these results are strong and we hope that they can be used to inform our programs uh, in the, uh, Uganda, in Kenya, but also in other countries. With this, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Professor Diliz Walker, to take us through the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much. But we have spent quite a bit of thinking about, uh, to have time thinking just about why we think this package worked when there are lots of implementation trials that simply don't, um, particularly for preterm babies when there's so much emphasis now on facility readiness and technologies and, and we really didn't go that route. So um, let me just show you a little bit of the process data that we've been diving into. Next, please. Um, that can give you a glimpse or a snapshot of how some of these processes may have led to this sort of behavior change around care for mothers and their babies. So breaking it down into the different component package, packages of the component of the package, you can see on the left how some of the processed indicators for the data strengthening um, were impacted by the intervention. And you can see that particularly the quality of the data in the maternity registered significantly increased and was maintained throughout the course of the trial. In the middle box, you see some of the process indicators around the pronto simulation and team training. This is among providers. You can see their knowledge across topic areas. And this is knowledge that not include not only preterm birth, but included preeclampsia, neonatal resuscitation, teamwork and communication. So this is a broad knowledge um, assessment. The next um, uh, two purple blocks there indicate provider behavior during simulated scenarios. So we videotape the simulations and assess the behaviors of the practitioners during the simulated case for a case um, related to preterm birth. And then in the, the teal column, we have uh, what happened to some of the QI indicators. And you, again, you see a drastic increase in behaviors, KMC uptake, provision of ACS in, in indicated cases, that all together contributed to what was going on. Yeah, but this is just sort of the data. It's data that reflects hundreds of providers and thousands of births, but it isn't really the whole story of what was actually going on. Uh, next slide, please. So, we believe that the way the interventions complemented each other and how the components interacted with each other is where the real story lies. Uh, we believe that naming the condition, making it clear, counting it, counting those stillborn babies and the pre-torn babies and their outcomes, while simultaneously improving provider capacity and confidence in managing some of these uh, conditions related to preterm birth, created this continuous cycle that became an enabling environment such that there were fewer stillbirths, fewer preterm births, 
and everybody could feel it and continue to repeat the cycle across the, across the period of the intervention and beyond. However, there are some additional critical factors that facilitated implementation. And these really, as we reflect back, are elements that contributed to the success and helped kind of create the self-sustaining cycle. First, visibility. It's really hard to explain how important this was. When we started the trial um, back in 2014, my first visit out to the field, no one really wanted to talk about preterms. They wanted to talk about all babies. And by the end, it was incredible to see how the mindset had shifted and how the commitment to saving these lives was um, embedded in everyone. Second, engagement. It was important to leverage local leadership and facility local ownership. Um, this became their project, their effort, and their results. And finally, teamwork was quite critical. Uh, there was no emphasis on individual behavior, individual change. Rather, it was all about the team, the unit, the facility, or the network of facilities that created this powerful sense of accountability to both yourself and others and motivated to do the best possible. So the idea that preterm infants could survive and thrive just took hold. So next slide, please. Um, you're here probably because many of you read that 8% of preterm babies' lives were saved during the course of this trial. This was a 34% decrease in the odds among um, those eligible babies. So we are left with thinking and leaving you with so what should we, this global community that cares about preterm birth, do with these results? Next, please. Um, as Peter mentioned, we think it's really important that ourselves and others really seek out opportunities to see if this package can work in other high burden settings. Is it really only successful if you've got a big enough hospital or is it also successful and significantly successful in smaller units? Um, we also want to know just what else can a package like this do? How powerful is it? Um, we need to understand how it is that this enabling environment was created and how do we sustain it? And could this same model be used to accelerate the uptake of other evidence-based practices that are important to maternal newborn health, particularly conditions contributing to high maternal and neonatal mortality? So, I would urge you to look closely also, and finally, at other ongoing efforts, efforts around preterm birth. Many are looking today, the publications are all about facility readiness and low tech, tech solutions to problems um, that can be solved for preterm births, which is absolutely true. But I think what I wanna drive home is we drove a significant change without doing that and we wonder what, how much power and how much greater increase could there be if you layered some of these technologies onto a scaffolding of a continuous cycle or an environment like this. Um, so let me leave you now with the words before we go to the Q&A with one of our Ministry of Health officials in McGorry County. The success story for us here is that the facility has a preterm section, the first one of its kind here. Mothers are now happy that even if they deliver preterm babies, chances of going home with live babies are high, um, and the mothers of preterm babies had no hope before the Preterm Birth Initiative Project, and now they have hope. And just before we go to the Q&A, I can't end without next slide, please. Um, close with acknowledging on behalf of myself and my colleagues, and recognizing first an enormous thanks to the women, children, and families who participated in this study. Um, next to the facility staff, the mentors and coaches who actually um, bought into this and were committed to make, uh, make changes in the places and in the environment in which they work. And then, of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, our advisory boards in across countries and communities, and our research partners at Kemri, uh, Macareri and at UCSF also contributed enormously and our, our partner Pronto International. We'd like to thank also the ministries 
I think maybe there may be some um, local ministry health officials on the line with us now. Welcome and thank you for joining us if you have. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you. And with my last word, you may have noticed that many of the images show babies with beautifully knitted hats. And that is thanks to a partnership that developed a number of years ago with Warm Up America, where we had a recruitment of many, many volunteers knitting thousands of hats, up to 50,000 finally, that have been distributed not only in Kenya and Uganda, but across countries across the world. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Nana, who will manage a Q&A session uh, for the next few moments. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Dulles. Um, so there are several questions that have come through. Um, I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, but let's try a couple. There's one about the, um, the incredible reduction in mortality. And the question is, um, it's very interesting to see facility-based interventions resulting in reduced post-discharge mortality, especially at 28 days. How do you explain that? Uh, perhaps we can have Felgona answer that question. Dr. Tiano, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we didn't have time to show all the slides, but uh, as it were, the, the, the outcome that we do present here is a, is a compound outcome, which is uh, linking, putting together fresh stillbirths, pre-discharge, uh, mortality as well as neonatal mortality. And when we break them and look at each of those post points, we actually see that there was significant reduction at each of those time points. And um, of course, yeah, it's very interesting um, to see that this, uh, this impact extends all the way to 28 days. And uh, definitely, there are several things that uh, that happened because of the empowerment of the, even the caregivers. Uh, when we use the safety as checklist, there's a, there's a checklist that tells uh, them about what to do with the baby, uh, danger signs, and the fact that the, the full package intervention had more power in the synergy of this, then we see that the impact was greater in the intervention side. So that's what I can say roughly, but we were also uh, happily surprised that this happened. Great, great. Thank you, Dr. Tiano. So another question is about um, the potential for scale. The question says, given the impact at the facility level, do you have any learning about the potential impact across the health system, for example, a district network or a regional level, um, recognizing that the facilities that were in this group were necessarily an entire district what are, what are the chances for scaling this up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an administrative region that's defined by government? Uh, maybe I'll give that to Peter. Peter, what, what, how, do you, how do you see the scaling up beyond the four hospitals in Uganda to a well-defined administrative region? Well, uh, first of all, scaling up is one of the challenges we have in global health that we have many successful innovations that uh, are yet to be scaled up. So this is a challenge to uh, the government and the partners. They need to pick up from where the scientists have ended. But having said that, in both countries, we took a regional approach. In other words, we've targeted all the facilities that uh, provide uh, maternal unit care and they had the uh, unit, uh, unit capacity. Uh, in fact, after we finished the trial, we rolled out the intervention to the control sites. And the, in the case of Uganda, uh, we've been able to, to roll out even beyond the hospital to other uh, health centers. And these are being sustained now by, by government. I can say al almost a year later, uh, the, the niches there are functional and working, and there is a lot of excitement. In fact, one thing which is very good in Uganda there must be a number of nurses listening on. We have a network on the WhatsApp of nurses and midwives that are quite passionate because now they know they save mothers and babies. But also we are trying to engage government. In the case of Uganda, they, we have money from the GFF, 
from the and the government is on investment and they are picking up the pieces to see how to support scale up but they, definitely this is a process where we need more uh, support from government and the partner to support scale up thank you great great thank you peter i think you've addressed a couple of questions about scalability and sustainability uh there's one question that um i'd like to address to dillis it says um without ultrasound uh, the gestational age determin determination is challenging do you think uh, lmp last menstrual period or estimated date of delivery is enough information to administer antenatal corticosteroid at primary and secondary health facilities in a safe manner what method did you use to um, ensure that without the ultrasound the the indication for acs use antenatal corticosteroid use was still valid and done safely yeah so that's a really good question and um briefly what i'll say is so no we did not have ultrasound uh, we relied on the provider's assessment of gestational age based on a combination of LMP, fundal height, um, and they made the judgment as to whether or not to provide them. We haven't gone in and we don't really have the data that's good enough to know specifically how many um, received them or not, or what the outcomes of those were. And I think in the future, um, this idea of, of you know, I don't think it's realistic that we're going to have ultrasound to know every gestational age when a woman comes in in preterm labor. So we're going to have to rely on other judgments. From We recently published, and I think it's come out, a assessment of gestational age looking at both our measures using LMP, EDD, um, gestational age written in the register, and that the, the four different ways of calculating. And across in the study, you can have one birth that can have four different gestational age measures. So this is truly a challenge and I don't have a good answer for that. And I think we need to all be thinking carefully. Great, great. And I'll take one more question uh, to make sure we have enough time for Dr. Smith's comments. So this question is about additional interventions that may have been added. The question is, did the intervention package include provision of drugs and medical supplies that may have been needed to deliver the evidence-based interventions such as the antenatal corticosteroids or perhaps a gestational wheel. And now I'll, I'll direct that question to Felgona. Dr. Otiano, please. I'm sorry, um, you are breaking. I don't know that it was my internet. Okay, so let, me repeat, let me repeat the question. It says, did the intervention package include provision of drugs and medical supplies that may have been needed by the providers to deliver the evidence-based interventions. An example would be antenatal corticosteroids or perhaps the gestational wheel. Yeah, well, thank you. So um, yes and no. Um, the intervention did not provide all the, the medications required, uh, but, in some the, but the gestational wheel was provided. Uh, in some cases when there was dire need for supplies, the, we, we would come in to, um, to meet those needs, uh, but uh, the main part of the intervention did not come packaged with, uh, with clear um, antenatal corticosteroids and the like. So basically what we saw, this, this is an implementation science kind of a study, so what we did was uh, in some cases we responded to the needs as the needs, arise, as the needs arose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, Let thank you. something uh, yes. on this? Please go ahead, Peter. Yeah. Yeah. So, in general, and for most of the work that uh, I've been involved with, we always know that we are starting from not a perfect situation. And um, as part of the initial assessment at the baseline, we assessed facility readiness, and then we were able to negotiate with the with the facilities to see what they can provide and what we can top up. I usually call that sort of catalytic supply of of commodities and, um, and the equipment. And then with time, the facilities are able to take over the process. Because in the case of Uganda, if um, let's say we need a certain drug, phenobarbital or antenatal corticosteroids, sometimes the facilities have not been ordering the, these for these drugs, yet they are available at the national medical stores. So the moment they learn how to use, then the nurses and the doctors on the world start demanding and they are included in the supply chain. So as it is happening right now, most of these facilities are maintaining the services 
uh, using uh, supplies from the government and for the NGO facilities now they purchase uh, these uh, commodities. So usually catalytic supply and then the system continues, but nothing out of like so much of the ordinary. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you, Peter. And I'd like to hand over to Dr. Jeffrey Smith to uh, give his reflections on based on what he's heard from the presenters as well as the Q&A. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Nana. And uh, first, uh, congratulations to the team for these important results. They really help to show us what is possible and how we can work taking a practical approach, as Peter described, a catalytic approach, but working in the realities of the system, how we can really uh, change the narrative regarding preterm birth. As Dillis pointed out in the beginning, we all know not only the, the volume of preterm birth and the contribution of preterm birth to newborn and child mortality, but we also have new information and new data from the um, the work that Margaret Crook did on the Lancet Commission and of, on high quality health systems. That it is really quality of care at facilities that are contributing to mortality and improving that quality of care is really the key to reducing mortality. So I think the team and this research really highlighted the importance of addressing quality of care. It was very important what I saw about all facilities that were provided um, certain interventions such as the data strengthening and the safe childbirth checklist. But I think we can see now that that's simply not enough. Doing data strengthening while that's important and providing the safe childbirth checklist is not important. Dillis highlighted the fact that we have to work within the system to generate awareness and response to the problem of preterm birth. I think part of this reduction in stillbirth uh, and early neonatal mortality was simply that effort to raise the awareness and mobilize the response of the team to immediate treatment of these newborns. In, there have been other studies that have shown that when we, res when we improve the immediate response of uh, the team to a preterm birth, we dramatically shift the, the categorization of neonatal and stillbirth deaths towards uh, a reduction of stillbirth. And, and that's an important demonstration that this study has shown. <clears throat> I think one of the other things that the, the study showed was the, the critical nature of working within the system to improve the capacity of the team, not only from the, uh, the improved record keeping, the use of data as a driver of change, the, in, the use of data as something that stimulates the uh, agreement of the team to drive forward, but also um, how that becomes uh, uh, something that is, can be sustained. I'm very um, enthused by what Peter said about the WhatsApp groups that have been established among the nurses and the providers. That to me demonstrates dedication and a willingness to continue this effort going forward. Um, there is so much to talk about with these data. There is such a rich data set. Um, I'm very excited to know that the team has planned additional webinars uh, to help unpack other parts of the data for us, the, the, the audience. The, there are a number of different um, webinars planned on provider perspectives, unpacking the intervention package a little bit more so that we can better understand what parts need to be replicated, looking at cost effectiveness. I saw that there was a question in the chat about cost effectiveness, and then another um, presentation planned on quality of, uh, or the group antenatal care um, approach. So um, I will end my comments here, but thank the team and thank them for providing us this opportunity and future opportunities to learn about their results. Congratulations. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. And um, I'd like to see if Dillis has any uh, additional comments beyond uh, saying the additional 
webinars are coming in the future. We'll send out specific dates when we have them. Yeah, absolutely. That we just put a couple of those up there. Um, there are there are is loads of data we will be diving into, and we hope to um, keep you all engaged with that. Um, the very last slide, in case any of you are interested in getting in touch with any of us. Uh, Please, these are our emails. We're looking forward to talking about this. We're looking forward to, um, and, I, and I think that the key to some, many of those questions in the Q&A that we did not get to, that will help guide what we decide to present in our future webinars. So please keep those questions coming because that will be really informative to, to how we move forward in disseminating this work. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. I'm gonna pass it back to Nana to close. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your questions. Thanks for engaging. And we look forward to seeing you all in future webinars. And please do contact the presenters if you have any questions that weren't specifically answered um, through the, because we had a limited Q&A session. So thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.